Good morning from WKYT News. I'm Bill Bryant and we welcome you to Kentucky Newsmakers. Later we'll be meeting the brand new president of the Kentucky Lottery as ticket sales have hit the billion dollar mark. In fact, top that for the first time ever for a year's sales. Some lessons on the lottery coming up shortly. But first, campaign 2018 gets rolling. Lexington State Senator Reginald Thomas has decided to try to move up to Congress and represent Central Kentucky in Washington. Senator Thomas declared his candidacy last weekend and is embarking on what he calls a listening tour. He's out to capture the Democratic nomination, but he's clearly focused on trying to defeat incumbent Republican Congressman Andy Barr, who is believed to be gearing up to seek a fourth term at the U.S. Capitol. In his announcement last weekend, Thomas addressed national issues, including health care and education. He talked about his own life leading up to the point of this decision to enter a high profile race. Senator Thomas is an attorney and an educator and now a Democratic candidate for Congress and he joins us on Kentucky Newsmakers. Senator, thanks for coming. Bill, thank you for having me. It's Appreciate good to it. see you again. Uh, you know this could potentially be a very tough and expensive uh, race uh, that you'll have to introduce yourself in other areas of the 6th Congressional District where they don't know you as they do uh, in uh, Lexington in your district. Why are you in this race? Bill, I'm in this race because our current congressman just really doesn't represent the people here in the 6th. Uh, I was really appalled at his vote to end the Affordable Care Act because that's going to do so many harmful things, Bill, for Kentuckians and particularly Kentuckians in the 6th Congressional District. Uh, his vote, Bill, would kick one half million Kentuckians, 500,000 Kentuckians off of health care. We've made tremendous strides, Bill, in this state over the last five years uh, with Governor, Governor Bashir's decision to implement Connect and, and Medicaid expansion. And now Barr just wants to throw all of that away. In addition, Bill, his repeal would bring back pre-existing conditions as a bar to insurance. As I point out in my speech, Bill, that's extremely significant. That, that would impact millions of other Kentuckians. If you have diabetes, if you have high blood pressure, if you have cancer, you will not be able to get insurance. I think that's wrong. Senator, as you know, that was a House vote and it goes to the Senate and now they cannot agree uh, on, on a bill, at least at this point, on, on, on what to do. So at this point, it is not on its way uh, to the president's desk. Uh, if there is no bill that goes to the president's desk to repeal and replace Obamacare, would you still hold Congressman Barr accountable for his House vote? You have to hold him accountable because he voted to repeal it. So yes, I would hold him accountable because that, that he, he's saying, I don't think we should have this for Kentucky. I think he's flat out wrong on that. What do you propose as, as a way to, uh, to deal with the, the matters? Uh, you know, uh, the Republicans do point out premiums have gone up, options have disappeared under uh, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, at the time, the Democrats controlled both uh, houses uh, of Congress. They forced through a bill. Now the Republicans are attempting to force through uh, this uh, repeal. Uh, how can this be fixed? Bill, I think the problem with health care for far too long is people want to try to soundbite it. They want to try to do one-liners. And it is a very complicated process. Health care in this country is extremely complicated. There have been a number of options floated as to how to fix it. One is the single-payer system, sort of Medicare for all. You know, let's, let's make health care you know, a, a right, which I do think is a right here in this country. Another option is, is the, what we call the public option, which the federal government comes in and say we're going to be a health care insurance provider just like Blue Cross Blue Shield um, or United Healthcare uh, and you have a public option available. There have been some other hybrid options that have been mentioned in some of the major newspapers, major magazines. What I'm going to do, Bill, is to be responsible. I'm going to research all the options. I'm going to explore them. I'm going to consider them. Uh, and, but let me assure you that by the end of this year, I'm going to come out with, with what I think is the best proposal uh, for this country going forward regarding health insurance. Let me back up just a moment. You did say you think health care is a right. I do. So you are therefore for universal health care. Some, some form or another, absolutely, without question. But how that manifests itself, whether through single payer, whether through public option, or some other hybrid, I want to give that some thought. And I'm not going to soundbite it, Bill. 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to simplify it. You know, I'm going to do something that's going to benefit all Kentuckians and all Americans. You made a point in your announcement about the role that education has played in your life. Uh, the uh, current political climate has been uh, moving toward pushing uh, most of those responsibilities down to state and local governments. Do you see a broader federal role for education? No, I support local control. But, Bill, I think here's the real push. I think there's a real push, Bill, to, to really privatize schools that threaten public education. If you, you saw my speech, I mentioned that. I think people take for granted that free public schools are always going to be in existence. But when you talk about charter schools, and you talk about corporate ownership of those schools, and you talk about vouchers, that's a real threat, Bill, to educating the public. Uh, and that's what I want to see maintained. I'm all for local control. I'm all for state control of public schools. But I believe schools should be public and that we, and that we should have free tuition, free availability for, for kids K through 12, and maybe beyond. I mean, I'm open to the idea. I'm not making it uh, part of my policy yet, but I'm certainly open to the idea of having uh, free tuition even through grades, what I would call grades 13 through 14, the first two years of college. Uh, you know, we tried that. Uh, as uh, legislative Democrats in our 2016 budget, and Gover Governor Bevin nixed that. But I think we ought to be going toward that way of expanding education beyond just the high school area. You said in your announcement, and, uh, and you said you don't dwell on it, but you, you talked about uh, you, you did not have the easiest of circumstances, uh, certainly in, uh, in growing up, and that education made all the difference for you. It, it did. And, and let me say, I, I had very loving parents. I, I mentioned that my dad died when I was quite young, 13. Uh, my mother did a wonderful job of raising my sister and me. I, you know, everybody thinks they have the best mother in the world. I think I had the best mother in the world. Um, so I'm proud of my family background. But yes, education made the difference uh, in my life, being able to have the opportunity to go to Dartmouth College, uh, later on to Harvard Law School, changed my life tremendously. Uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of what my family did to allow me to have those opportunities and that I took advantage of those opportunities um, and have become the person I am today. So you're off to the Northeast for this education. Was there ever any doubt in your mind that you would return to Kentucky? Not one doubt at all. <laughs> Matter of fact, <laughs> when, when, I, when I met my wife, Linda, and we started getting serious and we had to make some decisions about where we wanted to live, I told Linda that I wanted to come back to Kentucky. You know, being a D.C. girl, you know, she kind of paused about that, but but she ultimately relented. And, and and we used to say over and over again that the best decision, best decision we ever made as a couple was to come back to Lexington and raise our three children. Kentucky is among the majority of states refusing to turn over detailed information about voters to a, a presidential commission investigating the elections. Do you support that move by the Kentucky Secretary of State? Absolutely, I do. First of all, Bill, understand that Allison is not alone uh, in, in that decision. Forty other Secretary of States, both Republican and Democrat, have refused to turn over, turn over that information. So there's been broad bipartisan agreement that we're not going to turn that voter information over to the federal government. And, and why should we, Bill? There's, there's been no indication there's been any kind of voter fraud or voter misconduct of voter abuse in this state. You no, know, nothing that would indicate that we need to look at Kentucky and how they handle their electoral process. So I, I steadfastly stand by Secretary Grimes and her decision not to release that information. As you step back and look at this race, and uh, you, you said that you really have been looking at this for some weeks now. You were encouraged uh, to, to look at this race. Uh, you know it won't be easy. Fayette County is uh, about half the district's population. The rest of the population is in uh, the uh, other counties surrounding it, rural, uh, often Republican trending. Uh, how do you win this seat in the sixth? Bill, by working hard. No, it's not going to be easy, but it's doable. It's winnable. Um, and I believe I need to go out there, meet the people, Bill, have them look at me, you know, up and down, uh, look me in the eye, uh, and I'm going to tell them that I'm going to be a better congressman than what they have now, that I'm going to protect their health care, I'm going to protect their education, I'm going to make sure they have jobs, I'm not going to take jobs away from them like I be, believe our, uh, our current legislature did this past session. Um, and I believe if I do that over and over again, get my message out 
and talk to enough people that I will win this race. And I believe, Bill, I will, I'm going to win this race. You know, Kentucky Democrats arguably have not won a high-profile race in Kentucky since 2011, the re-election of uh, Steve Bashir as governor. Uh, do you find that the, the Democratic Party has a, a hunger or, uh, and better yet, the willingness to work uh, to try to win? And is this the kind of seat that they see possibly as uh, turning the tide for them? Bill, let me tell you this. Uh, yes, I think the Democratic Party has the hunger and desire. And, and Bill, I, I do think we work hard. Bill, what I think we don't do is that we don't give people a reason to vote for us. I think we got to have a clear, concise, simple message as to why people should vote for us. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do, do in this campaign. Let me say one thing to you, Bill. In this race, I'm going to run as a Democrat. I'm going to run on traditional Democratic values. I'm going to talk about jobs and employment. I'm going to talk about health care and making sure that everybody has access to a doctor. I'm going to talk about education, make sure that we secure free public schools and that people can have the best education for their children and offer their children a better opportunity than they had. Because that's what, that's what people really want, Bill. Everybody wants their child to have a better life than they had. So, so I'm going to go out every day across this district and sell those fundamental democratic values. I'm proud to be a Democrat. I've been a Democrat all my life, and I'm going to give that democratic message and tell people why they should vote for Reggie Thomas. Are you in contact with national democratic operatives who, uh, who might uh, invest in this race? Uh, the, there are some districts that are seen as targets, and potentially this one with uh, the Republican incumbent Andy Barr is, uh, is seen as a, a, a one of those. I was in Washington last week for two days, uh, talking with people on Capitol Hill. So yes, I've been in contact with them. But understand, Bill, that I'm going to run this as a local race. You know, this is going to be a race about the people of the 6th Congressional District from Franklin County and Anderson County on the west to Powell County and Wolf County on the east. So, so this is going to be a Kentucky race. But the answer to your question is yes, I've talked to people across the country about this race. Do you anticipate a, a strong Democratic primary uh, coming up next year? I, I do anticipate a primary. I mean, every primary, I, you know, who, regardless who is, who's in, will be taken seriously. So. And, and, and how do you serve effectively in your Senate seat representing Lexington in Frankfurt uh, when the, the big session is coming up, including the budget session, will be going on uh, at the time that you'll need to be campaigning? Well, Bill, I have to acknowledge that I am a state senator from Lexington and people elected me to do that. So you know, I've got to honor that obligation I'm, and I'm going to be there every day. You know, I'm very proud of the fact, Bill, that in the Four sessions I've been in the Senate from 2014 to 2017, I've never missed a day of roll call. I've been there every day. And God willing, I'm going to be there in 2018. So, yes, I'm, I'm going to make every session. But I'm still going to work in campaign. You know, there are 24 hours in a day, Bill. I'll probably try to use 18 of them and sleep the other six. But, you know, um, I believe we need a change in Washington. So I'll honor my student obligations from January through April work when I can on the campaign and then after April, it's full steam ahead all the way till November. During these uh, weeks ahead and then the, the months leading up to the election, do you hope to debate uh, other contenders, uh, including if you're successful uh, Congressman uh, Andy Barr? Well, I certainly intend to debate Andy Barr. Uh, and uh, I hope we have a number of debates so people can see us uh, side by side and make judgments as to who they think will be the better congressperson. Senator, thanks for coming by. Bill, thank you appreciate for having it. me. Thank I, you very I much. appreciate it. All right, it. thank you. And we hope you'll stay with us now on WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. In just a moment, we'll introduce you to the new president of the Kentucky Lottery, now a billion dollar plus business in Kentucky, next on WKYT. Welcome back to Kentucky Newsmakers, and it's so good to have you with us here on WKYT. Annual Kentucky lottery sales have topped a billion dollars for the first time ever. For 28 years, Kentuckians have been taking their chances with the numbers, and some have hit it big. The lottery is also transferring a record amount to state government this year, more than a quarter of a billion dollars. The new president of the Kentucky lottery is joining us this morning. Tom Delacensory left the Florida lottery to head north and take charge of the 
lottery here in the Commonwealth, and he joins us on Kentucky Newsmakers. We appreciate it very much. Thank you, Bill. Glad make, to be here. Making a move north in the summertime. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. It's good to have you. Uh, let's talk about this. These are strong numbers. What does it mean to have uh, surpassed the, the billion dollar mark in annual sales for the lottery? I think it's it's uh, it's significant. Uh, I think it kind of breaks kind of a, a mental barrier, if you will, uh, that they've come close before. Uh, but this time we broke that billion dollar mark, and uh, I see no reason why we can't build on that and continue to grow. To do that, what do you have to do uh, with the lottery? I think I just I have to basically, uh, as as head of the lottery, just get everybody focused on one thing, and that is that we can't transfer a single dollar until we sell a ticket. And so the focus really needs to be everybody focusing on how we can uh, improve our sales and by extension transfers to education. Which game sells the most? Our instant tickets. Yeah. Of that billion dollars, uh, over 600 million came from our instant tickets. And I think part of it is the appeal to the consumer is that we sort of hit everybody's price point. Uh, we have a, a ticket range from $1 to 25. So you have a lot of choices, and um, you know instantly if you're going to win or not. And so we've had a lot of winners with those tickets, and we've had a lot of sales. How important is it that you engage with those retailers out there who are statewide, maybe a small mom and pop operation, or maybe some large uh, retailer uh, that is uh, handling those tickets and uh, depending on uh, the lottery to help bring in a crowd to their store? Bill, I cannot stress enough the importance of our retailer base. Without those retailers, all we have is a warehouse full of paper. And they really make it possible for us to achieve not only the sales, but the transfers. In fact, I, before I came to the studio, we stopped into four stores, and I met and talked with uh, four very good retailers and always learned something. So um, getting to a billion dollars, they were part of that whole thing, and we were very grateful. Uh, is it true that, that big jackpots really bring in the players? You know, there, there are some that uh, uh, when the Powerball and the Mega Millions uh, <laughs> jackpots are really up there, so to speak, then everybody suddenly starts talking about, oh, we've got to play the lottery this week and so forth. Is it important that those jackpots be high, which means that uh, people have to go through some weeks where they aren't so high? It is. It's, it's a, a very interesting uh, psychology to me because uh, when the Powerball is 40 million when it starts out, uh, it's very difficult for us to get people to buy tickets and 40 million dollars is a lot of money. When it gets to be about 300 to 400 million dollars, it just seems that it hits a point where people think, you know what, it's worth two dollars just to dream about what I could do with that 400 million and maybe I'll win it. And you start hearing people uh, kind of putting together little syndicates within their workplaces and, and so you on. Do. You do. Uh, is it possible to uh, win a big jackpot and be anonymous? Um, not really because um, most most of the states and I think Kentucky is one of those I know Florida was you had to publish the name and so when I was in Florida and Powerball hit 1.6 billion. Florida had one of the three winners, and I think they netted out with about 358 million. Um, they can choose not to, you know, do a press conference. They can choose not to go public, but the name is is displayed. And it, I'm sure, is your desire that they do go public, that they do share their their excitement and their story and their dreams. Oh, right? absolutely. Uh, the the couple that won the 358 million, or one share of the 1.6 billion did come on camera and we had all the major networks and they were uh, they were an interesting couple because they were very down to earth and uh, it really hasn't changed their lifestyle at all, uh, but they're a lot richer. How many have you seen that want to try to do good with, uh, with their winnings? You know, more than you would think. In fact, uh, we had a, a doctor who won in Orlando a, a Powerball prize. I want to say it was maybe two to three hundred million dollars. And I think he gave all of it to uh, some sort of a charity. Uh, I don't see that often, but you do see a lot of good being done. How important is it to you to maintain the integrity of the game so that, that people know that there is in no way any funny business going on? Extremely important. If people don't have faith that it's a, 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 a good game, they won't play. So that integrity is paramount. Uh, many of, of us have seen the people buy lottery tickets when it's obvious that 
they really need the essentials in life. Right. Uh, how much responsibility do you take uh, for responsibly promoting uh, those uh, who, uh, you know, the, the selling of lottery tickets, that, uh, that people play responsibly, which was a, a tagline that was used uh, here in the Kentucky advertising uh, over the years? It's very important to us. We do not want somebody who um, needs money for food or rent uh, or family to be spending that on a lottery ticket. Uh, we, we work very hard to try to get people to understand it's, it's entertainment and it's something that if you have discretionary money, fine. If not, you should use it on something else. And, and really the goal is to uh, really expand the retailer base, expand the player base so that we're selling a lot of tickets to a few people rather than a lot of tickets to just a, a small number of people. As you're uh, learning the intricacies of Kentucky policy and politics, and I'm sure you're, you'll be immersing yourself in that ahead of the legislative session that is coming up and so forth, uh, I'm sure you are aware that there is from time to time some uh, guarded jealousy about uh, the, the uh, wagering money, uh, horse race business, uh, the lottery talk from time to time of uh, expanding to casinos uh, in Kentucky. Uh, is it important to you to keep that competition at bay or uh, do you think that everybody has the entertainment dollars and it's a matter of who markets the best who gets it? I think that's what it is. I mean if you look at us as a product, a product has to stand on its own merits. Uh, you see that in Walmart, you see that in Target. Um, and so I think it's, it's that way with the lottery as well. We have to put out a good product we have to compete with all the other products out there and we have to make it so that uh, players want to play the lottery. How do you decide when you're going to introduce a new game? You know, or there's going to be something that is going to be rolled out? Well, I, I can't speak to how they've done it in the past, but I can tell you that I put a great deal of faith in uh, survey work. So asking our players, asking our retailers, <clears throat> doing focus group studies to try to find out if we're hitting the right chord. Now, by themselves, that probably isn't good, but when you combine them and you get the same kind of answers, then you're, you're pretty sure that it's going to work. Even, you know, I mean, P&G spends a lot of money and a lot of research, and even they come out with products that don't work, so we're going to have those. But if you can do a lot of homework up front, you can eliminate some of the, the problems. Tom De La Century is here. He is the president of the Kentucky Lottery, and we're going to ask him uh, some more questions in a moment, including uh, the money that is transferred over to state government, and how do you keep people interested over the long haul? Kentucky Newsmakers coming right back. Welcome back to WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers, and Tom Diller Century is with us this morning. He is the president of the Kentucky Lottery, and uh, he is uh, learning about us in Kentucky as he uh, takes charge of the Kentucky Lottery. After many years of experience uh, with the, uh, the Florida Lottery, what are the differences you're noticing between Florida and Kentucky so far? Well, one has 20 million people and the other has 4.6. That's a difference, So right? that's a fairly big difference. but. Um, uh, other than that, I think in terms of, um, you know, the retailers and, and the lottery itself, there aren't that many differences. Uh, Kentucky, uh, uh, Kentuckians, uh, I would think, find it important that uh, this money that comes from the lottery goes a certain place. In fact, it was uh, sort of sold to Kentuckians in 1988, and those with long memories uh, recall uh, that uh, this would be for education. It went through some iterations in the 90s and so forth before finally uh, being basically directed that way. Uh, more than $250 million was transferred to uh, state government uh, next year. Is it your goal to do more? Last yep. year, that was last year, you want to do more? We definitely do, and, and if we increase those sales, we will increase those transfers. And that was one of the things that appealed to me about Kentucky because it basically is the same mission as Florida, which was transferring dollars to education. Uh, what, I, what I think is so important about Kentucky is that we've made it possible for over 560,000 students to go to college. Now the benefit to that bill is that we're keeping those students here in the Commonwealth and there's a good chance that they will also get jobs here and contribute to the workforce. So I think it's very, very important that that mission is fulfilled. And so when uh, it, it comes to the, the education component of what the lottery supports, that's very important to you, would you say? Extremely important uh, because, you know, the interesting thing is you can now follow students who have We've made it possible for them to go to college. Maybe they're the first in their family to ever go to college. Not only that, then they get a job, and then they become successful at that job, and we can trace those people and basically have them tell us that none of this would have been possible if they wouldn't have had that 
uh, college degree or the scholarship from the Kentucky Lottery. So it's very, very important. How do you keep people interested in the lottery over the long haul? How do you keep them going in there on the, the, the nights of those drawings or during the week and in in scratching off those tickets? It's a constant marketing effort. And, and, you know, again, it's how do you keep people buying Cheerios over and over again? Uh, you, you find that certain people like certain games. They're favorites of those. Uh, some people we try to attract uh, to play new games. Uh, others we try to uh, uh, just share the winning experiences. So it's a constant marketing effort and making sure that we're listening to both the customer and the retailer. You've been on the job about a month. What is your impression of how well run the Kentucky Lottery is? Well, I knew coming in that it was uh, one of the premier lotteries in the U.S. Uh, now that I've been here, I've been very impressed with the staff, their commitment, their dedication, their knowledge. And so the goal is just to make sure everybody's got the laser focus on uh, raising sales and transferring dollars to education. Do you do a quick pick or do you uh, pick your numbers? Well, I can't you do. You can, right? I can't do either. <laughs> what do you suggest people do? <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the one thing, tough part about this job. You can't win the lottery, I right? Cannot. <laughs> I cannot. But statistically, uh, it's been shown that uh, there are more winners from quick picks than when you have your own numbers. Those that have their own numbers would never do a quick pick because they just like mm -hmm. those numbers. But statistics t show that uh, quick picks, are there's a slight uh, winner uh, increase from quick picks. Now that quick pick number can come up the same in, you know, one in Kentucky, one in North Carolina, one somewhere, the same number, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you stop to think about the split second uh, <laughs> that's involved in these lottery tickets, but yes, it can come up, and that's where we actually had three winners for that $1.6 billion Powerball jackpot. Well, we appreciate you coming by today, and uh, welcome to Kentucky. Good luck at the Kentucky Lottery. Thank you, Bill. It's with pleasure. Uh, Tom DeLacentury, who is now running the Kentucky Lottery. Thank Thank you for joining us for this edition of Kentucky Newsmakers. I'll see you bright and early this week on WKYT This Morning. And for political updates and some Kentucky observations, follow me on Twitter at KY Newsmakers. Have a good week ahead.